Hello to any friends joining us via recording. We are covering lesson number two, which is about the cell. We are going to go ahead and dive right into it. When we look at the cell and human cells in particular, the first thing that we're going to see in, in almost all of our human cells is this big structure here in the middle. This big structure here in the middle is called the nucleus. That's what, what makes us different from bacteria, the fact that we have a nucleus. And the nucleus is where we store all of our genetic information. The genetic information of our cells and all kinds of cells uh, is, is called DNA. So we'll talk more about DNA next week in lab when we talk about how your cells divide. Your DNA has instructions for everything that you're going to be doing in that cell. What makes your cells able to function are the directions that DNA has. Now, DNA uh, is used to build things like proteins. And one of the places that we build proteins are these, these blue things that we see around here. These blue things are what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You can see these little brown spots on the outside of it. These little brown spots are tiny things called ribosomes. And ribosomes are your protein builders. So a lot of your ribosomes live on the outside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER, as we sometimes call it. But we also have some ribosomes that live floating around in the soup. The soup inside a cell is called the cytosol. Let me get a pen here. I'm gonna try to write. I apologize in advance. It'll probably look a little funky. The soup inside your cell is called the cytosol. This is not quite the same as that thing we learned about in uh, earlier classes called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the soupy stuff in the cell plus all of these organelles that are inside of it. So for the sake of our anatomy class, we're calling the soup cytosol. That's more technically accurate. Floating around inside that soup, we see some things like these little spots, the little ribosomes that you see here. Um, you can also see these little purple lines right here. These are things that make up what's called the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is groups of proteins that give a cell its shape. So we're going to talk about in lesson number four, some cells that have really funky shapes. They're called neurons. And the way they can have those funky shapes is because of their cytoskeleton. Inside the cell, we often need to move things around. And that's another thing the cytoskeleton helps us to do. Uh, so you can see little things like this, this floating guy right here. This floating guy right here probably represents something we call the lysosome. So the lysosome, think of them kind of as the trash service for your cell. They're gonna break down organelles that don't work anymore. They're gonna chew up proteins that are the wrong shape. Uh, lysosomes help us to, to break stuff down. Kind of an, an opposite of that here is, is our friend here in orange. Our friend here in orange is called the mitochondria. The mitochondria, as we, we know from high school, what did, what did your high school teacher teach you was the function of the mitochondria? I get the exact same words every single semester. What did we memorize in high school for the mitochondria? High school the cell. Exactly. Yep, <laughs> we're, we're typing it in. It's word for word. I always get, it's the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> and, and for high school, that's totally fine. Uh, when we are in college anatomy, though, uh, when we talk about what the mitochondria does, we're a little bit more specific. We say that the mitochondria makes ATP. Absolutely. Uh, so when we're talking about, about the function of the mitochondria, it makes what's called ATP. And we will talk more about ATP in lesson number four. Think of this kind of like the energy money for your cell. So if we're doing something that doesn't happen naturally on its own, we're going to need ATP or that energy money to do it. That's what our mitochondria help us out with. We can see over here in pink this large flat organelle. The large flat over organelle over here is something called the Golgi apparatus, or sometimes you'll hear it called the Golgi body. They're both the same thing. Uh, when we talk about the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus, its job is to kind of package things. A lot of times when you're talking about the cell like it's a city, 
um, will say that the Golgi apparatus is the post office. So it packages stuff up and it sends it throughout the cell using that cytoskeleton to move stuff around. There's another organelle that we can't necessarily tell for sure where it is in the cell, and that is something called the peroxisome. Let's see if I can write that. Peroxisome. The peroxisome is uh, basically like the immune system of your cells. So if something gets inside that's that's toxic for you, there's these things called free radicals that are chemicals that can mess up your DNA. Uh, we will use our peroxisomes to make sure that uh, that doesn't get to our DNA. It'll break stuff down for us. The only other organelle we can see in this picture that we haven't really talked about is uh, this part over here. This part over here is what we call the smooth ER. It's smooth because it doesn't have ribosomes. Because it doesn't have ribosomes, it's not going to be able to make proteins because ribosomes make proteins. So the smooth ER is going to work with lipids, going to work on fats. Uh, it's also going to help us with detoxifying like the peroxisome does. To help us consider how we need all of, of these parts of our cell to be able to to function uh, for a cell to be alive, I want you to consider something that is all too pertinent to us right now. I think we're all a little too familiar at this point, right, with, with having to be in quarantine because we were exposed to someone with COVID or because we have COVID. Remember way back at the beginning of the pandemic, if you had COVID, they said, do not leave your house for 10 days. Let me see if I get my outline right there, 10 days. So if you were stuck in your house for 10 days, there are some things that you would need for the duration of those 10 days. Let's get creative here. Let's share with each other in our chat. What are some of the things that we say we would need if we were going to be locked in our house for 10 days? What are some thoughts? Put in the chat for me. Yeah, lots of us honing in on. We definitely want food, right? Um, food and water, snacks of some kind, absolutely. I like that a couple of us are like, hey, if I'm stuck at home, there better be something to do, right? Entertainment, I like that. Yeah, I kind of like the way that, that Dusty summarized it, right? Like the basic essentials. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, let's let's go on. So Steve mentioned internet. Um, let's let's go with that internet thing too. Internet is is no good if you don't have power, right? So we're gonna need to have some electricity as well. Um, it's not we're not currently having having a blizzard, right? Uh, but if we were having a blizzard, we would use that electricity to help us to heat our house, right? Or, I mean, it's Texas, you never know. In three days, it could be like 90 degrees. Again, might need air conditioning, right? When we're thinking about the kinds of things that we need to survive inside our house for 10 days, most of them, not quite all of them, but most of them, we can relate to the things that cells have inside of them. Uh, so let's start with, with things like the basics. So when we're talking about something like food, when you eat food, besides the fact that it, it makes you feel good, right? <laughs> um, what is the basic biology reason that we eat? Why do we need to eat food? What's the purpose of food? Exactly. Yeah, several of us are chiming in. It's all about energy, right? It's all about having the power that your body needs to function. Just like your, I, I love it. Yeah, Valerie's like to fuel our minds. I like the way you think, Valerie. It is all about the mind, right? <laughs> Actually, we'll talk about this later. Your brain hogs a lot of the, the food that you have inside your body. Your brain is like, give it to me. I need it all. So that's that's a great connection. So we need food when when we're locked inside our house for 10 days. That food we use to build energy or to build ATP. When we talk about being inside a cell, 
what would be the thing that builds energy or ATP inside our cell? What organelle did we say helps to build our cell energy? Yeah, it's kind of a mean question, right? Because that is a, a, a long organelle, absolutely. The organelle that, that builds this energy is called the mitochondria, absolutely. So just like food helps us to build energy, the mitochondria helps us to helps all of our cells to build the ATP that they need. We mentioned in addition to having the energy from food, we also wanted to have energy uh, like electricity or like Wi-Fi, electricity, or we'll put Wi-Fi, we'll, we'll link them together because when I lost one last February, I lost both, right? Power and, and Wi-Fi kind of go together. Just like food was kind of a, a thing that would represent mitochondria, it's the same deal here with our electricity. Uh, to power your house, to power your cell, we use those mitochondria. Hey, we talked about you being stuck at home. When you're stuck at home, you are inside something, right? Whether it's the walls of your apartment or whether it's the walls of your house. When you're thinking about a cell, I, I didn't actually mention this organelle, but does anyone know the name of the walls around the cell? It's not actually a wall in humans, but do we know what that thing's called? Yeah, exactly. The so so let's put here. We'll put the walls. Yeah. So dividing the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. That's the job of something called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. We're going to talk about especially on Wednesday why it's so important that we have a dividing line between the inside and the outside of the cell. So just like it's important for you to have a dividing line that keeps your heat in or keeps your cool in, depending on what time of year it is. It's the same way with your cells. We have to have something dividing inside and outside from one another. Um, I can't remember if we mentioned this for sure or not, uh, but if we were stuck by ourselves, by ourselves at home, at home for for oh, oh, make sure to make mute. Sure to mute. I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Perfect, okay, I think we're good. Uh, if we were stuck by ourselves for 10 days at home, we probably would want some way to communicate, right, with, with the outside world. We'd want to have the ability to talk to our friends, whether it's via email, whether it's via texts or FaceTime, depending on how much we love someone, right, <laughs> at what level of communication we do with them. So uh, when we're talking about things that, that help us to communicate, uh, remember that we talked about how the Golgi apparatus helps us to package things and send them throughout the cell in the same kind of way maybe that an email would be sent. Um, or that membrane also could function in, as communication with the outside world. It allows us to interact with our neighboring cells. So I know it's kind of a silly example or maybe not so silly if you're at home on quarantine right now, right? But as you consider our cell, which again, we'll spend more time on in lab. Everything that you would want to, um, to function when you're stuck at home are the same kinds of things that our cells have to have to be able to function as well. So we've got organelles that do all the things you would want. Um, that's, that's in summary what we're talking about here. I told you that the the job of the plasma membrane is to divide the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell and the reason that's important is because the fluids that we find inside the cell are different from the fluids that we find outside the cell so when we talk about the types of fluid that we have in the body their location is going to tell them uh, or is going to tell you what their name is so let's start with the first kind of fluid that we see over here. It's called intracellular fluid. Intra means inside. Cellular means a cell. We talked about on our, our picture of, of the cell, 
the anatomy class name for intracellular fluid. Did anyone happen to write that down? What did I tell you was the name of the intracellular fluid, that jello stuff inside your cells? Yeah, I'm making you type a lot today. I apologize. Got to keep you engaged, right? <laughs> Love it. Okay, lots of us caught it. And it does take a little time to type, but I, I love that that we're, we're typing it for me. That's perfect. Here is I, I'm going to my, do my typical Dr. Alice thing. Here is an underline highlight star idea, meaning here's something that's really important. Here's what it is. The one kind of fluid that's found inside your cells, the one intracellular fluid is called cytosol. All the other fluid types that we're going to talk about are all found outside of cells. So the other kinds of fluid would be what we call extracellular. They're on the outside of the cell, but intracellular fluid is the, the only kind we have is cytosol. When we talk about extracellular fluids, they're always found outside of cells but they're going to be found inside different locations. That's how we get their name. So if we're talking about extracellular fluid, it's outside of our cells, but it's inside blood vessels, blood vessels, we would call that plasma. So if you've ever donated blood, you are donating the cells that live inside your red blood vessels, but you're also donating the liquid that they're floating in called plasma. Plasma is the fluid outside the cells, but inside a blood vessel. If we're talking about the fluid that's outside of our cells, but it's inside what we call tissues, which is the stuff that makes up all of your body, tissues, that kind of fluid would be called interstitial fluid. Interstitial means in between. Interstitial fluid is in between our cells that are found inside tissues. So when you poke this part of your arm, the fluid that's here in between your cells, that's gonna be interstitial fluid. If you're looking inside a blood vessel in your arm, the fluid inside there would be called plasma. But the fluid inside all the cells of your body, that's the fluid called cytosol. So the locations of fluids tell you their names. I'll mention that the guided lesson has a couple other fluids to make sure that you review. Things like lymph fluid or synovial fluid. Synovial fluid should ring a bell, right? Because we talked about that in lesson number one. Do you remember what we were talking about synovial fluid in, in lesson number one? Does that sound familiar? What was that about? Exactly. Yeah, several of us are mentioning we talked about synovial fluid when we were talking about the joints. Synovial fluid is the fluid that we find in your finger joints. The fact that the bones of your fingers can move is because there's this synovial fluid in between them. Hey, let's do a quick review. I'm going to start with with an easy question here. When I am talking about the anatomy of something, like it has synovial fluid in these kinds of joints, um, that does or does not help me predict what that joint can do. Is physiology related to anatomy? I promised you I'd ask this question, right? Gotta ask it. Exactly, yep. Physiology and anatomy are definitely related. So when we talk about these joints having fluid, that's the anatomy, right? It's what they have, it's what's there. When we talk about these joints moving, that's the physiology, that's what they can do. So anatomy and physiology, definitely related. If I've got fluid in places, that's gonna help me do different jobs than remember those sutures in your skull, the sutures don't move. The bones come together and they stick and we're not going to be able to move those joints. So 
anatomy and physiology of joints. Quick review because we're talking about synovial fluid, the fluid in some of those joints. This graph helps us to get an idea of how abundant or what volume of each of the fluids we have in our body. So when we're looking at this graph, this is what's called a pie graph. When we look at this pie graph or this pie chart, the size of a piece of pie is, it tells us how much of it that we have. So when I look at, at the piece of, of pie right here for my, where's my pointer? There we go, okay. When I look at this piece of, this piece of my pie right here for intracellular fluid, this piece is very big because this piece is so big that tells me i've got a bunch of this kind of fluid so when we're to oh dr Ollis just messed up didn't she let's erase when we are talking about what i have the most of what i have the least of we look at the size of our, our piece of pie so my intracellular fluid, I've got the most of that. That's the biggest piece of the pie. What's the next biggest piece of the pie? Actually, that's not fair. That's a lot of typing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let me change a question. Let's, let's do a, a easier question. Interstitial fluid, that's the next biggest piece, right? So interstitial fluid, I've got the second most volume of that. Can you tell me where I would find interstitial fluid? Where do I have this second most abundant fluid? It is outside cells, but it's inside something. Where's interstitial fluid found? Exactly, yep. Intracellular fluid, that was our cytosol stuff, right? This was the stuff that was inside the cell. But then we start doing the stuff that's outside the cell. And if we're outside the cell, we're in all kinds of different places. So like you all are telling me, interstitial fluid is what I find inside the tissues, inside the tissues. That's my next most abundant fluid. Then we've got, we can see over here, the plasma. Plasma is the next most abundant. When I talk about plasma, that is outside of my cells, but inside what? Where is plasma found? making you type a little more, aren't I? I'll give us a chance to catch up. Exactly, yep, plasma is what we find inside our blood vessels. Notice from my graph here that I've got this other slim piece that's all the other fluids in the body grouped together this is is a very good example. You know how like chihuahuas are like the loudest dogs you'll ever meet. The smallest dogs bark the most. When we look at the fluids in the body, we've got a ton of different kinds of fluids that we find in this category. So synovial fluid, um, we're going to talk about cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, this includes the fluids in your eyeball. This other fluid, this thin piece of the pie that's left over has a bunch of different names. So I'm not gonna ask you to know the names of all of these fluids. We'll bump into them in the rest of the semester. But here's the big takeaways from this graph. Make sure we know what kind of fluids we have the most of compared to the least of. And again, make sure we know that this cytosol word means the fluid that's inside a cell. I want to pause for a moment to give you a chance to ask any questions in the chat, or if you're tracking with me, send me a thumbs up or a smiley face or something to let me know you're tracking. Let me pause for a moment. I love it. Perfect. I like the monkey Kaylee. 
Perfect. Okay, so Danae asked a good clarifying question. Uh, so when we talk about interstitial fluid, let me bounce back to our, our picture here. Interstitial fluid is not inside the blood vessels. Um, it is in the, the kinds of tissue that's around the blood vessels. So if you look down in your wrist, hopefully, or somewhere in your arm, you can see a blood vessel. The fluid that's inside that blood vessel would be the plasma. But when we look at the, the, the other colored tissue that's around it, that's where these cells that we see right here, that's where these are found. They're in what's called the tissues. So tissues are groups of cells that don't live inside a blood vessel. They live around those blood vessels, but they're also surrounded by fluid. So the fluid inside blood vessels, plasma. The fluid inside tissues, interstitial fluid. Let me scroll up, see if there's other questions. I love it, Dakota. Your comment about loving a AMP. Perfect. That that is that's a good uh, good approach. <laughs> Shelby's still trying to wake up. That's okay. Uh, so there's a question about if you're missing some of the notes, where do you find them? Um, so check out the modules area of our class. There's the notes outline there. Uh, that's where these pictures come from, the notes outline. There's also the guided lesson that will help you to fill in the other parts of that outline that we don't cover together. So the guided lesson is underneath those, those outlines. We have talked about the names of the fluids. We've talked about where they're found. We're going to do a little bit more interpretation with our, our graph here. And we are going to talk about the recipes for different fluids in the body. Part of the reason that we have to divide the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell is because the things we have inside the cell are different from the things that we have outside of the cell. We are now looking at what's called a bar graph. When you look at a bar graph, the size of the bars on the graph tell you how much we have of something. So if I have a really tall bar, like I see up here, that tells me that these kinds of fluid have a lot of the thing that's down here at the bottom. Whereas if I have a really small bar, that tells me there's not much of it. The colors on these bars are going to help us to figure out what fluids we're talking about. So my first two bars that are really tall are these ones up here. And we've got a blue bar, which represents interstitial fluid. And we've got this red bar that represents plasma. Interstitial fluid and plasma, these are both examples of extracellular fluids. Now, I believe in your notes, you have plasma and interstitial fluids separated. Is that correct? Do we have, have three parts of, of this? Yes, okay, so everyone's telling yes. So uh, my slides are a little outdated and we'll see why that's important here in, in a moment. So when I say extracellular fluids, I'm talking about plasma, gonna abbreviate, and I'm talking about interstitial fluid. So we're looking at our graph. The first thing on our graph, we're trying to figure out how much sodium, that's what NA stands for, sodium, I find in various fluids. Well, my two fluids that have a ton of sodium are the interstitial fluid in blue and the plasma in red. So both of these are an example of extracellular fluid. I would say, get my pointer back, that I have a lot of sodium in plasma and interstitial fluid. Now I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna look at Cl minus. Cl minus is chloride. Cl minus chloride, again, I've got a lot of that in interstitial fluid and plasma. I don't have a lot of either of those, they're called ions because they have a charge. I don't have a lot of either of those ions in my intracellular fluid, in my cytosol. So I have to put that cell membrane, I have to put that wall 
dividing inside from outside to make sure that that these levels stay different. Now we're over to K plus. K plus is the scientific abbreviation for potassium. When I talk about potassium, notice this is my first thing that intracellular fluid has a lot of. So now we're down to intracellular fluid. My recipe, if I was going to mix up some intracellular fluid, I would add a bunch of potassium to it. The other thing I would make sure to add to my intracellular fluid is proteins. You can see on my graph here that proteins are the highest inside the cell. You did some reading about all those things that proteins do. We talked about how proteins make up the skeleton of the cell. It's called the cytoskeleton. Uh, but they also do things like help us to do chemical reactions. They're called enzymes, uh, or they, they have big important functions in our cells. So big idea, lots of proteins inside our cells. The other place we see relatively a lot of proteins as well, though, is right here in our plasma. So this is why I divided it up for you in your notes. Plasma has a lot of proteins inside of it. Interstitial fluid doesn't. We can see it's a little teeny tiny bar right here. There's not a lot of, of proteins in, in interstitial fluid, but there is a lot in plasma. Before I ask my next, next question, let me ask this one, just a review question for us. When we talk about plasma, where do I find that? Where is plasma found in your body? Exactly. Yep. Plasma is found inside your red blood, your, your, uh, your blood vessels, around those red blood cells. When we talk about putting a bunch of proteins inside your blood vessels, there's a couple of different jobs for these proteins. One of the jobs for these proteins that are floating around inside your blood vessels is to help to clot your blood. So if you get a cut, we don't want it bleeding forever. We will talk about in unit number two how blood clotting works. So we've got some proteins that help us to, to patch holes in your blood vessels. That's one of the groups of proteins that we see in plasma. The other group of proteins that we see in plasma are called antibodies. Or sometimes if you're, if you're doing micro, for example, um, they'll call them immunoglobulins. So these are immune system proteins that help to make sure you stay healthy. So we've got these special proteins in plasma. That's what makes the recipe for uh, plasma different from the recipe for interstitial fluid. So if you ever see homework questions that are asking about recipes, all I'm meaning is check out our graph. If you were going to mix up in a bowl some interstitial fluid, what would you add to it? Or if you were going to mix up some plasma, what would you add to it? Or if you're mixing up intracellular fluid, what would you add to it? Now, uh, when we look at a cell, we can use that graph to give us an idea of, of what it looks like inside compared to outside. So again, let's do some terminology review. When I look at the fluid that's here, inside my cell. Can you remind me about the name of this fluid that's inside my cell? What's this inside fluid called? That stuff inside here. Exactly. Yep, that stuff is called the cytosol. Absolutely. Remember that cytosol had a bunch of potassium. So you can see all of our, our potassiums in there. Potassium is one example of a type of ion. Ions are things that have a charge. For those of us who had a chance to work on lesson number five, do you remember what we would call potassium since it has a positive charge? What was the word for an ion with a positive charge? Did we get that far? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of, of different terms. We're seeing some of the things, and we'll talk, unfortunately, if you're not a chemistry person, I apologize in advance for next week. We got to do a little bit of chemistry next week. Uh, when we talk about an ion, a charge thing, with a positive charge, we call that a cation. Cations have a positive charge. And next week we'll talk about the way you get that positive charge is you give away a electron. You give away one of your negatively charged things. Now you have a positive charge. So cations are things like potassium, which you've got a bunch of on the inside. They are also things like we see on the outside and we talked about on, on our graph before. It's also things like sodium with a positive charge. These are my cations, my positively charged things. You can also though be what's called an anion, and an anion is a charged thing with a negative charge. So when we're looking at this picture right here, our anion is the chloride ion because it has a negative charge on it. Anything with a negative charge is an anion, Anything with a positive charge is a cation. When we look at the cells, the inside of the cell has a different charge than the outside of the cell. We're gonna talk about this more in, in a couple of lessons. We have this thing called the resting membrane potential. Resting, I'm not gonna write this whole thing. Resting membrane potential. That means the normal difference in the charge. Inside and outside are not charged the same. That's what resting membrane potential is. But the word that we used in your notes outline right now to explain how we have a different charge inside and outside is a word called polarized. Polarized. The membrane is polarized if the charge on the inside is different from the charge on the outside. And here's something I want you to write down in your notes for me, because sometimes this is a little bit confusing for students. A cell being polarized is a good thing. It's good for your cell to have a different charge inside compared to outside. Because when we're talking about cells like your neurons, or we're talking about your muscle cells, they change their charge to be able to do things, to send messages, to do a muscle contraction. So we have to have a different charge inside compared to outside for our cells to be able to function. So it's a good thing that your cells are polarized. Inside has a different charge than outside. I wish that I could take credit for this, but I am not this clever. Uh, so the last thing I want to cover with you before we split into groups is a mnemonic from my friend, Mr. Anderson. Um, he's my virtual friend. I haven't actually met him, uh, but Mr. Anderson has a video talking about the anions and the cations that are more concentrated in different places in the body. So his mnemonic is a salty banana. So imagine that you've got a banana, that is your cell, and we sprinkle it with salt. That's where things are located in your cell. So when we talk about salt, um, do, I, do I have any chemistry friends that happen to know what the chemical formula for salt is? Or what we would call salt if we're being all chemistry fancy? Yeah, exactly. So several of us are mentioning that the fancy uh, chemistry name for salt is sodium chloride, which sodium, that was our Na plus, and chloride, that was our Cl minus. Remember, I'll bounce back, when we were looking at our cell, we had a whole bunch of sodium and chloride on the outside of our cell. So we sprinkled some salt on the outside of a banana, that's sodium and chloride on the outside of the cell. When we think about bananas, there is one particular ion that they have a bunch of inside of them. 
What did we say that was inside our cell that bananas have a lot of? Anyone remember? Yeah, exactly, that potassium, right? Potassium is what bananas are known for. Yeah, and, and like we're mentioning here in the chat, the, the chemistry signal symbol for potassium, weirdly, is K+. So we've got a bunch of potassium inside bananas. We also have a bunch of potassium inside our cells. I'll mention that the other thing that bananas have a lot of, that our cells have a lot of on the inside as well, um, is something that is the cell's favorite food source. Does anyone know the name of a cell's favorite food? What's a cell's favorite food? Yeah, a few of us know, that's perfect. Cell's favorite food is called glucose. That's an underlying highlight star. We got to know that. Our cells love glucose. It's a kind of sugar. Glucose is, is the only thing that your neurons will eat. They're very, very particular, which is why your body actually has the ability to turn other food sources back into sugar so that your neurons can eat. So bananas have a lot of sugar inside of them. They can help raise your blood sugar and your cells have a lot of glucose inside of them too. And I'll mention, let's pretend our salty banana is, is the perfect banana because the other thing that the perfect banana would have is a lot of protein inside of it. Your cells have a lot of protein as well. Let me pause for questions or thoughts, anything along those lines or emojis. How are we feeling about this stuff? All right, I am uh, getting, uh, so Dusty asked a question about um, how ions form. Um, ions, we'll talk about this more next week. The way that we get things that have a positive or a negative charge is by um, adding an electron to it or taking one away. So we'll talk more about that in, in lesson number three, but all of the things inside your body um, if we go down to the chemical level, they've got protons with a positive charge, electrons with a negative charge. We will add or take away electrons. That's what makes an ion. So more about that coming soon. Uh, I see a question about the quiz link not working. Yeah, it's not going to work until 930. So don't freak out about that. Uh, Diana's asking if you have a page for this slide. I don't think you do um, because this is actually if you um, this would be something to be good for you to draw somewhere. The closest you have to the salty banana. Let me get my my pointer back here. Um, you could probably put it next to this picture that you have. So it, it's not something that I, I put in your notes uh, because I stole it from from Mr. Anderson, <laughs> but you can draw yourself a little banana and we'll be doing a whole lot of banana drawing. Uh, especially when we get to muscles and when we're talking about neurons, that's that's really important. I love it. Kaylee's saying I'm starting to feel more confident. That's that's perfect. I like it. Good. Yes, yeah, so some clarifying questions about the quiz. Yes, if you are a Wednesday lab person, you're not taking that quiz until Wednesday, so it's not going to pop up for you until Wednesday at 930. For all of my Monday lab friends, and you, your announcement will tell you if you're Monday or Wednesday, for all of my Monday lab friends, yours will show up at 9.30 today. But everyone else, it's not going to show up till, till Wednesday for your Wednesday class. All right, really fast, I am going to assign us to groups. Dr. Allis was like, hey, I'm going to be smart today. And I'm going to make my um, 
I'm going to make my groups ahead of time before class. And then I get to class and uh, they're like, just kidding. We're not going to put anyone in these groups. So bear with me as I start to assign you all to groups. Our group work today, we're going to use um, the Google form again. That seemed to work much better for us than my, my AM lab friends. You know the struggles that Dr. Aulis had. Uh, let me let me assign everyone really fast. I apologize. I'd really hoped I'd found the solution. Oh, interesting. I'm learning new things every day, y'all. Thanks for your patience with me. What we're going to do with our neighbors here in just a moment is I am going to give you a link that has six statements in them. And each of these statements are going to be incorrect for some reason. And you and your neighbors are going to have to figure out what's wrong with these statements and how can I fix it? So I'll show you in just a moment. I almost have everyone assigned. I'm also going to show you before I split us up into groups how to share your screens because I know that a lot of us had that question last week. So I'm almost through. 11. OK. All right, while it is assigning everyone, let me show you our statements here. You've got six statements. So the first two statements are talking about organelles. I want you to work with your groups. Don't put anything in the chat now. Save it for, for your group work here. But we've got um, uh, two statements here about organelles. There are two ways you can correct the statements. Either we can change the name of the organelle or we can change the function. So either way, with your groups, you can decide how you want uh, to, to divide things up. Um, that's the first thing that we're, we're going to do. Uh, the next set of statements is about those fluids that we talked about. Uh, so you're going to determine which fluid actually uh, answers these questions, or you can change the statement in another way to, to make those fluids work. The final statement that we're going to do talks about some of those things that come mostly from, from your reading. So we didn't talk a lot um, about today, just a little bit about glucose. Um, we did talk about this word polarized. So um, six different statements that you're gonna correct with your groups. Stay in your group when you've submitted your form, uh, because if we have time, we'll move into some of the stuff from the second half of, of our, uh, our class. Let me show you, I'm gonna pull over, uh, I got a group of you that didn't get assigned, odd. OK, let me pull over for you my screen to show you how you share your screen. Only one person in your group will have to share their screen. So let me show you. I'm bringing over my window. When I get into my group, doesn't matter what group you're in, you're going to click on yours is going to have a little box with an up arrow. Right now it has an X on mine because I'm sharing my screen. But when you get into your group, decide in the chat who's going to uh, be typing the, the answers for you, that person right up next to the leave box, there's gonna be a little white box with an up arrow. Click on that and it'll give you the option right here next to it to share your screen. You can share your screen with your neighbors. They can either talk to you or type their answers in the chat for you, but that's how we share our screen. Any questions before I send us into groups? And I will be able to uh to help you out when you're in those groups all right well let me go ahead and open up our groups uh oh the one other thing i need to do right it would help you if you had your google form right <laughs> so let me get that i'm going to put that in the chat everybody go ahead and open this up on your computer if you can uh, you only will need one person in your group to actually do this, uh, but if everyone pulls it up, you know what the questions are. So here's that form. I will send it again once my groups open up. Remember, one person in your group 
is all it takes to write in those answers. Once your answers are submitted, just chill out in there for me. We'll figure out if we have time to move on or if we'll call it good for a day. So stay in until I post an announcement telling you what to do. All right, let me open up those groups and we will get to it. For those of you still chilling out, your room should be opening soon. I promise it's coming soon. 